often get asked, what are the usual costs to consider when buying catamarans? And they vary as to size and location of boat, but let's just go over the main ones. And I'm gonna have to generalize in some cases, otherwise this video would last hours. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the first things to consider is if you're financing. Now, you know, Americans and Europeans have a much easier time getting loans and generally what the lenders are looking for is 20 to 30 percent down they want to see your FICO scores over about 720 and they look at your debt to income ratio and they do not consider charter income in any way in fact they they don't like it and I can explain why if you call me up um, and uh, oh by the way this is a uh, leopard uh, power catamaran and uh, they're very stable platforms they cruise faster than the sailing yachts and uh, they have those big fly bridges I love the space you get up there it's a great party platform anyhow back to financing and um, so uh, the lenders will give you, right now the rates have been, uh, this is now in June 2020, uh, right now rates are between 3.75 fixed and 4.3 fixed, uh, depending on your FICO scores. The loans are simple interest, no prepayment penalties. Uh, you can amortize them 15 to 20 years. Some lenders will only go 15. And uh, they um, make the closings much more complex, 200% more complex. So if you can avoid lenders, that's better. All right, so now how do you figure the cost of your loan? Okay, so uh, with the rates where they are, generally it's $6 per thousand borrowed on a monthly basis. So let's just say you borrow 200,000, um, that would be, 1200 bucks a month payment okay just as a very general rule of thumb okay so that's how you figure what your loan payments are going to be all right now let's talk about insurance um, and if you get a loan of course you're going to have to have insurance and they're going to want the yacht the the policy to name the insurance company as additional insured in case you lose the boat they're going to get paid off and so insurance is running about one and a half percent of the declared hull value per year. So let's say we're talking about a $300,000 yacht, one and a half percent is $4,500 a year. And that's, um, you know, that's an agreed upon policy, which means they can't deduct for depreciation if there's a total loss, which is it's the only kind of policy you want to have because they play tricks with you if they can depreciate things because they will depreciate as much as they can if they have to pay you off. Now, when you get uh, to a hull value of over about five, 600,000, those rates go down to 1.2% per annum. And, you know, you must shop, 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 and shop some more because, you know, you, there are some underwriters that just, are way overpriced and you know they'll they'll try and make you believe oh well we're the only ones out here that'll do this no you, you got a shop there's a lot of different companies around the world and if you're a customer of mine you're going to get a special list of the carriers that have been writing the most competitive policies recently there's usually about 10 carriers on there uh, check out this uh, Ipanema 58 I don't know if you can see it here um, uh, this is, uh, uh, we're in Bahia Mar Yachting Center in Fort Lauderdale, and you know, in the winter, this whole dock I'm on would be full of cats, but right now, most of them have gone north for the summer to enjoy the better weather up there. All right, next on the expenses list is registration. So how you register the boat can affect whether you pay taxes or not. So if you buy a boat, 
say in the Caribbean, where most catamarans in the world live, there are no taxes. It, it's very simple. And, but just in case your state charges personal property taxes, you may want to register in the tax-free state of Delaware. There's 200,000 yachts registered there for this reason. And you know anybody can register there. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen. Um, and if you you can do two kinds of registrations. If you're an American citizen, you can document the vessel, which is really just a federal registration. And that it's took usually six hundred dollars right now for documentation. And you must form a corporation. You can't do it individually in Delaware. So that's usually $300. So total 900 to document it. If you do a state registration, state of Delaware, it's pretty easy. You have to form that same corporation for 300. And you know, if you're, the size of your yacht is between 40 and 60. The last time I checked, it was $100 to register. And the only thing about state registration is some foreign countries don't accept it. In the Western Hemisphere, Martinique and Guadeloupe sometimes give you a hard time over that. Sometimes they don't. It just depends on the mood of the customs agent when you check in. All right, now let's talk about deliveries because chances are the boat's not going to be in the place you want. So let's say it's in the Caribbean. Well, uh, delivery companies that are approved by the insurance companies try to get between two and three dollars a mile. You know, they'll ask three, sometimes they'll settle for two, especially if you can uh, get the, uh, a crew that's on a backhaul. And I can explain that in detail if, uh, if you give me a call or send me a, a text. All right, so now there are other places to register and uh, a lot of them are just more expensive and they don't really give you much more except maybe privacy um, you can have nominee directors in a company, and so a lot of these owners of these super yachts, like this one back here, if you can see that, I'm trying to do this backwards. <laughs> and if, uh, now you see, a lot of these people, they don't want you to really know who owns it, so they would uh, have a company in a jurisdiction like, say, you know, BVI, Cayman Islands, Panama, and, you know, they'd have nominee directors, so, you know, uh, it's, it's very private, but that's a lot of money, you know, 10, 15,000 minimum for something like that. All right, let's talk about dockage since we're in this nice marina with floating docks. Keeps it really easy when you're tying your boat up because you can just leave the, the lines on the dock and, you know, already set. So all you have to do is just loop the loops around the cleats and you're done when you come back. Um, now, dockage varies widely by location, and generally when you're in urban areas, it's much more expensive. Now, in South Florida, we have had the real estate developers buy up every marina that came on the market in the last 20 years, so we've lost over half of our marinas, and so the market's tightened up, and so it's much more expensive to get dockage here. Now, so if you are living on the boat, that's a different zoning law that applies. And you see, when you have a first class marina, they require you to have certain things like, you know, pump out facilities nearby, extra parking spaces, extra trash pickup, because it's just more expensive when people are living on boats. So, you know, like right now, at this point in time, we, if you want a slip over here for, let's say, a 45-foot boat, it's probably around 1600 a month in the off-season, and it can go up from there in the winter. Always try and book it in the slow season, in the summer, for this location, okay? Now, if you're just storing a boat and you're not living on it, that's cheaper. And we have, in Fort Lauderdale, 250 miles of waterways, canals, rivers, and, you know, it's usually between 10 and $18 a foot behind a private home. These are people that are usually retired on a fixed income that want to make a little extra money. So um, that's a cost-effective way to do it. You just can't legally spend the night on the boat there. So 
If you do that and you come in to use your boat, well, you just fly in, move over to one of the free anchorages and spend the night there on your way out to the cruising grounds. All right, that's <clears throat> dockage. And now dry storage um, is usually more expensive, except in certain locations. And you know, let's say you need hurricane storage. Now, a lot of the insurance policies will say something like, well, if you're gonna stay in the hurricane zones, we're gonna double or triple your deductible. So they're gonna make you take, assume some of the risk. So um, a lot of people will go south to say Grenada or Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao. Those, are, those three are called the ABC Islands. They're Dutch uh, West Indies Islands. So they're very well run. It's not like a third country there. It looks a lot like South Florida when you get there. And the last two summers I went there for surveys and uh, I talked to all the marinas that I was near and I found out that they had plenty of slips all last year during hurricane season for 35 cents a foot a day. And then if that's for wet slips or dry storage. Now, if you have dry storage, you have to pay for the haul out too. So you got to add that cost. Haul outs vary by location. And so for example, in a Caribbean island with a lot of competition, say three boat yards that can haul out catamarans, uh, there's, the prices will be lower. And um, so on a survey, when you're trying to figure out, okay, what's it gonna cost to haul it out? That's called a short haul. It's usually less expensive than a long haul where you're gonna like block it up and store it for long periods of time. Um, and so for the survey purposes, haul, haul out very widely, but let's just say between $300 and $800, depending on location. For long-term uh, hurricane storage, like I said, the ABC Islands, 35 cents a foot a day, plus haul out fees, you can't, you can't beat that. Um, another place boats go uh, is um, Grenada and Trinidad. Now, Grenada's yards fill up by May, so you have to book it well beforehand, otherwise they're going to be full and they won't have room. Uh, Rio Dulce in Guatemala, uh, you know they have like 1,500 yachts there during hurricane season because it's cheap. I mean, I've seen catamaran slips there for 450, 500 a month for, with basic electricity and water, and it's beautiful there. You can and you know prices there for food and entertainment are cheap. So a lot of American retirees go to Rio Dulce in Guatemala. It's right on the Belize border down there. Um, and then, you know, another place you can go in the summer is the northern U.S. I've I spent a summer in New England and man, it was it was the best cruise we ever had. We didn't expect it to be that, but it was really great because of the, the weather. You know, you wake up in the morning at 60 degrees. It might go to 70 eight or 80, but only just for you know, a few minutes. So uh, it's not like it's unbearable hot up there. All right, so now let's talk about surveys. The price of surveys for catamarans has been running between 20 and $25 a foot. So 40 foot boat, that's uh, $800, you know, to maybe a thousand. So um, it varies by location. And when there's more competition, of course, the prices can be lower. Um, and, and in a few cases, they work by the hour. So that would be about, you know, a hundred bucks an hour. And, um, so we recently did one in St. Thomas for that. And so the price actually was very reasonable. All right. So, and then again, haul outs, uh, for the survey, bottom inspection, you know, between three and $800, depending on competition in the island. All right, so now let's talk about add-ons, okay? Um, a lot of people want to add on some equipment to their catamarans, such as solar panels, generators, air conditioning, water makers, tenders. All right, so, um, and you know, if you can get on a 40-foot cat around 1,600 watts, of solar panels on up to 2000, you can run everything you need to live off grid, such as, uh, you know, keep your batteries topped up, run the fans, run the lights, 
um, and freezers and fridges. So uh, now we we did one on a, about a 40 foot cat with a, a, a bracket on the stern mounted on the sugar scoops and then we the 1600 watts were up there on the panels and and that price came out to about six thousand now you know the owner sort of helped out a little bit with a few things um by you know helping to mount the the uh supports on the back of the boat so you know he saved a little money there um and you know if you are one of our clients we'll uh tell you how to buy solar panels super cheap um, all right, so generators, you know, they vary widely by the number of kilowatts that they put out. And, you know, if you're running a charter yacht that's, you know, 45 feet, 50 feet, that's a crude yacht, you know, those customers expect ice cold air conditioning and first class service. So you'd probably need a bigger generator to run, you know, 48,000 plus BTUs of air, that could be a 20 kW. And so those are probably gonna be, you know, in the, around $20,000. Uh, air conditioning, if you wanna add it to a stripped out charter boat, because a lot of these European boats, they don't have air. Europeans don't like air conditioning. They think it's unnatural. And a lot of cruisers don't like them because they're high maintenance. And when you're living on the hook, there's plenty of wind to keep you cool. So you don't really need it if you're a hardcore experienced cruiser. Um, we can also connect you with the manufacturers of air conditioning so you can buy factory direct, save some money. Uh, water makers, there's a water maker here in Fort Lauderdale made uh, called a Seawater Pro. And it's 21 gallons an hour 12 volt and it costs only $1,600. And the best thing about it is you can get any replacement part at any Ace hardware store. And so the, those stores are all over North America and they're starting to be seen in other parts of the world too. And so for 1600 bucks, you can't beat that, okay? Now tenders, um, there's all kinds of, of different tenders that you can get. Now the charter managers tell me that the best tenders that last the longest are uh, AB and Highfield. So th these are the top of the line uh, catamarans, uh, tenders for catamarans because you know catamarans are very weight sensitive. You don't want to load up the ends because it increases the pitching moment when you're sailing in certain sea states. So you want to have the lightest dinghy that you can, if possible. And a lot of these davits are purpose built by the manufacturers to be a maximum of say 850 pounds. And that doesn't allow for a very big dinghy. So, you know, a lot of people might modify their davits and we can tell you how to do that cost effectively to carry a little bigger dinghy. All right, so those are some of the add-ons that you, most people wanna have. Um, but we have a, a person on staff that's been doing refits for 29 years and he can pretty much give you prices off the top of his head. But most contractors need to see the boat in order to give you a sharp quote. All right, so now let's talk about depreciation. Um, I'm gonna go back to my office and, uh, and just draw that out because it's easier to look at a picture for that. Okay, now annual maintenance. You know, everybody wants to know how much am I going to have to spend on this thing to maintain it properly. And you know, I bet you if you ask 10 people, they give you 10 different answers. And, you know, somebody with very deep pockets, like a billionaire, I mean, he's going to spend a heck of a lot more than I will or some people I know. So, you know, it's all kind of an individualized thing kind of like you know well what do you spend to maintain your car so well anyway let's put it this way when a boat is brand new what's your annual maintenance well you have to do a bottom job okay you have to service the engines and the drives so what does that cost well okay i've had bottom jobs for 40 to 45 footers for around four thousand dollars all inclusive two coats of paint micron 66 and um 
The servicing of the engines, let's talk about like a 54 horse Yanmar. Uh, well, it's $1,000 each per year. And they service the sail drives. You have to do that every year. You got to change the seals. There's four of them. And the problem is to change two of them, you got to haul the boat out. So you might as well plan on that every year. Some owners defer maintenance and you want to try and look at the maintenance logs because if they do that, you know, this could cause problems later on in the life of the boat because you don't want to skip certain things. Now, that price I just gave you would be valid for the annual maintenance for like a one-year-old boat, a two-year-old, a three-year-old. Now, starting in year four, things change. The components on these catamarans start to fall apart and you, these costs can mount, okay? Depending on how well you want to take care of this toy of yours. And so usually by year five, the boat is ready for a refit. And you know, a 40 foot cat, 45 footer could need between 50,000 and maybe 60 um, to have the boat perfect, okay? And a lot of people won't spend the money because you know, catamarans have double the components that can go bad. The useful life of many things is only five to seven years. So this is where it gets difficult to estimate your costs and so I can, when I see the boat, I can usually tell you what it's going to need and we can get a pretty good idea. But it varies so widely by make of boat because there's different build qualities and I can explain that to you if you give me a call and what it has on it and where you're going to go. So if you're going to go around the world, remember you need a really reliable boat and you need to you know, make sure everything is in good working order, which is different from if you just do weekend sailing somewhere along the coast. All right, and then there's the issue of repairs. Um, some of them can be deferred. And I think what I'll do is a whole video on that because that's a subject that can take a long time to go through. Um, so that's uh, pretty much it for today. If you're interested in more information or my insider secrets guide to buying catamarans, just send me an email uh, at bigyachts at gmail.com. It's on my website, largecatamaransforsale.com. And I've got a lot of other videos uh, available on YouTube if you just search for me. Uh, just put in catamarans and Gary Fretz. You should come up with all of them right away. And uh, so I look forward to working with you and uh, smooth sailing. As an aside, as I was walking through Bahia Mar Yachting Center, I saw this big 100-foot houseboat. And I love to walk through this marina because you see all kinds of different uh, yachts. And uh, so this thing has uh, got a huge interior. And then this yacht over here is uh, called a fed ship. And um, those are the Rolls Royces of motor yachts. Um, that one will set you back, uh, I understand, a $44 million. Uh, if you bought one today. And so, um, hope you uh, enjoyed my little tour. <laughs> Just one other little trivial side note while we're here at Bahia Mar. If you come to the fuel dock to get fuel, they have a small little nature preserve um, right next there that was uh, started in the 1940s and they've allowed all of this, these plantings, these bamboo trees and other trees uh, oh, look at the koi pond over here, to grow up and, you know, it's now mature and it's just a beautiful, cool place to go rest and um, maybe have a little bite to eat if you're in a hurry. And, uh, well, let's cross over the bridge here. So it's, uh, it's quite a nice little uh, unknown treasure that's <laughs> here at Bahimar. Let's talk about the dreaded D word, as in depreciation. And, you know, I founded the Moorings Yacht Brokerage, and I ran it for 10 years. And we had access to a ton of data about selling prices of different types of yachts. And we did a study involving hundreds of boats, and we compared the price paid when new 
to the price that the yacht was sold for in year five. And now you must remember that all of the selling prices of new yachts are different, even for the same model. You know, a lot of people say, well, how can I find out what it sold for new? Well, they're all different because there's many reasons for that. Uh, there's equipment differences, locational differences. There's motivation on the side of the seller and the buyer. So it's always different. So you have to really just look at large numbers of these and look at the actual price when new and then the price when it was sold. And in this particular study, it was in between year uh, uh, five and then early part of year six. So the yachts that held their value the best were owner version catamarans here in blue. And uh, so in year five, they fetched 63% net to the owner after selling prices. So that's pretty good. Um, happy experience. <laughs> Charter version cats didn't do so well, but so they fetched 54%. Um, and the worst were monohulls. Uh, now these, this data comes from the Caribbean, which is where more catamarans live than anywhere else. So in the Caribbean, there's just not a lot of demand for five and six year old monohulls. And therefore the market is relatively depressed for that type of boat. Now notice, you know, in year one, the depreciation here, it's, it's about 20%, more or less. And this curve of depreciation flattens out over time so that right around year five and six, it continues on a flat line if you maintain the boat properly, which means, okay, you have to compound and wax it every year to keep the, the shine. You have to service the engines and sail drives and, and do the bottom and so on. And so if you do that, it will stay straight. However, what happens in year five, and the charter companies all know this, and this is why they want to get rid of them really fast, and starting in years five and six, is that the expenses, your repairs and maintenance start to go way, way, way up, okay? And so you could have on a, say, a 40-foot cat, it could be, you know, 30,000 a year or more, uh, but they're all different. You know, it depends on the build quality. It depends on the equipment we're talking about and location too. So now, but this is the, the point to remember is that all this money that starts to fly out of your bank account starting in year five, you're never going to get it back or maybe just a fraction, like 10 cents on the dollar because the market doesn't appreciate that, okay? So what I say, the smart thing that I've learned over the years is that what you want to try and do is capture the most depreciation and buy the yacht somewhere in this range, somewhere around here, but don't keep it to year 10 because by year 10, it's going to need a big refit. Like, you know, a 40 foot yacht could need 50 grand or more. And so what you want to do is you want to buy it right around in here and that, but sell it here before it like, turns into a total money pit. So, you know, just keep it like two and a half years, something like that, Be, and sell it when it still has a little life left. And if you use the locational differences, you know, that I've talked about in other videos, um, about high demand areas and low demand areas, you wanna buy in the low demand areas at the low time of year, and you wanna sell in the high demand areas and at the high buying season. If you do that, you can actually get back what you paid in this time if you don't wait too long. And so a lot of my customers will buy in here. They'll buy it right, you know, the right time of year and the right place. And then they'll sell it in the right time. And they get back all their money. Some of them even make money. So this is the smart way to buy boats. And uh, I hope you got something from this. And so if you want further information about selling prices, we have a database. It goes back to 1998. There's 270,000 yacht sales recorded on there. And we can, I'm happy to share this with you so that you know what the market's doing just as well as I do.